We are in uh, Isaiah chapter 59. As you know, we're looking at some of the passages in the book of Isaiah. We had studied basically verse by verse or chapter by chapter all the way through chapter 53. And then what we've done over the past couple of days, weeks, we have switched to certain principles within the book of Isaiah. We've got two to go. Today, Isaiah 59. And next week, Isaiah 66. By the way, in case you want to know, Isaiah 66, 23. All flesh shall worship him. Today's lesson is basically uh, referred to as Jehovah's hand is not shortened. Because of Israel's present dangers that have been brought about by their own iniquities and their own sins, Israel cannot imagine that God wouldn't save them. Or to put it another way, Israel imagines that God doesn't have the ability to save. He doesn't have the capability. He's like the gods around him. He's too weak, so they will turn to those gods, and then they will commit even greater sin. But there are forces pushing on them, pressuring them, trying to destroy them, and yet they will not call upon God to save them. And when they do call upon God to save them, and this is where they see the in ability of God, their prayers are not answered. Notice in verse one, the concept. Jehovah says, behold, Jehovah's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Now what God does here, he tells them the problem. He lets them know, in contrast to their imagination, here is the issue, here is the problem, and it's from God's standpoint, therefore it's a true, accurate standpoint. He's precise in what he has to say. It's not a matter that God cannot. It's a matter that God will not. And that's because your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, so that he will not, he will not hear. So you can see the distinction between what Israel is thinking and what God knows. God knows he will not save them because of their sins. Because of their sins, they have gotten in the position that they're in and they cannot imagine that God wouldn't save them even in the midst of their transgressions. First thing we're going to do is look at their sins as Isaiah outlines them in Isaiah chapter 59. Now, your Bible may read just slightly different than what I'm reading. I'm reading from the 1901 American Standard. You may be looking at the King James, the New American and the or the New King James. I'm not going to read all of the rest of chapter 59, but I think some of the things that he has to say verse 3 through verse 8 on, have a lot to do with the sins that they've committed. Here's what he says. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue muttered wickedness. Obviously, what he's talking about here is murder. He says it again after a while. Then verse 4, none sueth in righteousness, none pursue, none follow, and none pleadeth in truth. When you plead, you don't have truth around you. You've got wickedness. They trust in vanity. They speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Now here in verse 5, he switches and he uses a an intense, a picturesque figure of speech. They hatch adder's eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and they which crusheth breaketh out into a viper. I don't know whether you see that figure or not, but that is an absolute, that's picturesque. What they're doing is bringing forth venomous eggs when they are hatched and the product is produced. 
death, crushing, and terrible consequences will come of it. They're not weaving a spider's web. They're weaving death. Verse 6, their webs shall not become garments. Of course, you make clothes out of cotton, and even in some cases, you make it out of uh, spider's webs. Well, they don't. It's not garments. Neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Garments cover themselves. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. <clears throat> That's what they're putting on. Verse 7. Their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are their paths. The way of peace, they know not. And there's no justice in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Wheresoever goeth therein doth not know peace. Their way is not a way of peace. Their way is a way of disaster. Their way is not a way of peace. Now, when you read Isaiah and you see all the times that Isaiah has called attention to Israel's sins, here's what you're doing wrong. Here's the consequences of that. And that's because they are in the nation of God and they're going to reap dire, ill consequences, ill fortune because uh, their transgressions and because of their connection with God and what God has done for them. You would think, you would think, after hearing Isaiah for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, that they would repent, that they would change. I would draw a parallel, an analogy to what's going on in the United States in Portland. We have leaders of this nation that call that a myth. They won't even pay any attention to what's being done in Portland as far as the riots and the murder and the burning and the tearing up and the beating and the mistreating of human beings, among other things. They just turn a blind eye to it. That's what Israel's doing. That's what Israel's doing. And here's the thing. Portland doesn't see what they're doing wrong. They think it's great because they have been taught a particular culture. Well, Israel hasn't been taught that same culture. They've been taught what to do and what's right. But it just goes in one ear and out the other. And then when they get into trouble, they call upon God. But God is not going to save them, is what uh, Isaiah is saying. Not unless you repent. Not unless you change. Now those are some lessons within that passage that we can learn. We can learn the fact that the ungodly and the unrighteous, their prayers will not be heard. There's no if, ands, or but, buts about that. That's the way it is. Furthermore, the practice the habit of sin prevents God from saving the soul, whether it's a child of God or a sinner in the world. If we're going to practice and make a habit of sin, we will destroy our own souls because God will not save. Those are two of the great lessons in this passage that we're going to pursue. Turn with me to 1 Peter 3, verse 7. We looked at this passage a week or so ago. This week, we look at the concept in, within the context of what Isaiah has continued to say throughout his book. The ungodly and the unrighteous, their prayers are hindered before God. Here's what Peter writes. Ye husbands, in like manner, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, giving honor unto the woman as unto the weaker vessel, as being also joint heirs of the grace of uh, life, to the end that your prayers be not hindered. The word hindered is cut down, cut off, cut out, hewn down. That's an obstacle. That's an obstacle. The way a husband treats the wife gets in the way of their prayers reaching heaven 
The old timers used to say that some folks' prayers do not get above the ceiling. In other words, the ceiling can hear you when you pray, but that's as far as it goes because it's hindered your ungodliness and your unrighteousness. And sometimes it has to do with the way we preach treat our wives and women around us. I realize that the world around us sees the Bible as something that lambast women. It is supposedly, they say, treats women as inferiors. They are not. You'll notice the last thing that Peter said in this text at the end that your prayers, uh, pardon me, as being also joint heirs of the grace of life. As we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, that means man and woman, as far as their spiritual state before God, is co-equal. Both are joint heirs. Now that doesn't mean they have uh, equal or the same responsibilities. A man cannot bear a child. That's a different responsibility. A male, he's the one that is to be the head of the house. As I was talking to somebody the other day, The best way and the best thing for a home is that the wife be in submission unto the husband. That's not saying that the wife is inferior. That says the husband has an obligation that the wife doesn't have. That's all that's being said by that. You also notice in the text, and we brought this out, that the wife is the weaker vessel. Generally speaking, whenever you look at women overall and men overall, as we've stated, women are not as strong as men physically. Physically. Right here, I'm not going to. Proverbs 28 9. Proverbs 28 9. And John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, 30 and following, you have Jesus walking among the children of Israel, and there is a man that was born blind, and he heals that man. The Jews would call him on the carpet and ask the blind man, who did this? And he wonders, verse 30 and following, he marvels that you do not know. God, as he says in verse 31, if any man be a worshiper of God and do his will, <coughs> him he heareth. We know that God heareth not sinners. A number of decades ago, I used to take uh, some tape recordings from one of our schools down in Texas, Western Texas. And I remember the teacher. I thought he was a great teacher. And he made the point, he said, look, the blind man is not inspired. The blind man doesn't even know. He has no idea. Of course, in later years, I found out that in reality, the blind man knew a lot more than our preacher friend. He's quoting. He's quoting the Bible. Notice with me Proverbs 28, 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. I think you can see what we're just now talking about. And you can see exactly what Isaiah was talking about. God's ear is not full of wax. He has the ability to hear. He has the ability to answer. Let's look at God's ability to hear and God's ability to answer. And I'm going to say it this way. And I've said it this way dozens of times. God hears the prayer of the righteous. God hears the prayer of the faithful child of God, Christian, every time. And he answers every time. Now, after saying that, I cannot stress upon you to listen to why I say what I say. I've said it over the years more than once, and I still hear people that I think a great deal of that they don't quite catch what's being said. How do I know God answers prayer? Because I got what I asked for. No, no, and no. I know that God answers prayer because God said he did. 
and answers the prayer of the faithful child of God every time, every time. I'm reading 1 John 5, 14. Now, there are certain qualifications, certain conditions of an answered prayer. 1 John 5 certainly gives the qualifications. Yes, there are other passages, but this one hits it, hits the nail on the head. And this is the boldness, this is the confidence, this is the assurance which we, children of God, faithful children of God, have toward God, that if we ask anything, do not stop reading there. Do not stop reading there. If you stop reading at that point, you will fail to grasp what John has said, and you will go off in an area that John has not gone. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. What's the condition? Number one, you got to ask. But when you do ask, you have to ask within his will. We're going to see an example of that here in just a moment. 15. And if we know that he heareth us, and we do whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions which we have asked of him. Not only does he say, God hears you, Verse 15 says, you have the petition you've asked. What is the petition that you ask? Lord, if it's your will, I want a brand new Lamborghini. I want a brand new 747. Wait a minute. Ron, is that within what God wills? I want you to turn just a second in your minds and we're going to go through some things. How do, you, how do you determine that God answers prayer? How do we determine? Here's an atheist. Here's his charge. Listen closely. And it would be really, really good to stop and ask the students some questions. So as they say in, uh, on Laughing, listen closely the first time. <laughs> oh, you didn't catch it. Here's the atheist charge. Christians cannot demonstrate or prove that God answers prayer. How would you answer that? How would you answer that? Christians cannot prove that God answers prayer. What do you mean prove? I mean, I'm an atheist. And when it comes to prayer and you Christians praying, you can't use prayer to prove that God exists. That's true. That's true. You cannot prove, you cannot use prayer as a method of proving to an atheist or anybody else that God answers prayer. I can prove God answers prayer, but not because I got what I asked for. This atheist continues, and he shows you his erroneous reasoning because what he's done, he's heard, he's heard brethren, he's heard preachers, he's heard religious people say that God answers yes, no, not yet. Why, that's foolish. That's not going to prove anything. It's not supposed to prove anything. It's not supposed to prove anything here's the atheist the religious fellow makes the excuse that if god failed to give him what he prayed for it means god did not want him to have it the yes no and not yet argument is a very poor argument i'd have the same results praying to a shoe mr atheist you do not prove God exists by your prayers being, by a Christian's prayers being answered. Here's the Christian. Here's the Christian. I spoke with brother so-and-so and he said his wife's COVID-19 test came back negative. We are thankful that our prayers have been answered. So here is a close friend, 
and he makes the argument. We know God answers our prayers by the fact that the tests have come back the way we prayed. Is that a good test? Do we know God answers prayer in that way? Someone says, Ron, what he said was that we are thankful that our prayers have been answered. Have you ever thanked God for saying no? Have you ever been thankful when God said no? then why are we only thankful when God says yes? By the way, I think it's excellent. I think it's great that when something from man's standpoint, when they think God has blessed them, that they honor God. There's nothing amiss about that. But do we honor God at other times? At other times? Job honored God in the midst of his trouble. Of course, he didn't know what was going on, so there were a bunch of questions. We've got the answers that Job did not have. Now, what I want you to do is turn to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, and I want you to see, I want you to follow with me. Here is a righteous man whose prayer was heard and answered the way he prayed it, and the Bible teaches that he prayed, and the Bible teaches that God answered his prayer. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, Jesus, who in the days of his flesh, having offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, having been heard for his godly fear, Though he was a son. The passage just said. God was able to save him from death. And that the Lord would pray diligently. And petition God. So when I turn over to Matthew chapter 26. And other writers of the gospel. I read where Jesus was in the garden. If possible, let this cup pass. Not my will, but thy will be done. I think every one of us recognized that what Jesus just did was he followed the condition of 1 John chapter 5, even though he was the only begotten Son of God. And his prayer was a petition to God. And his petition to God was for a particular salvation within the will of God. Within the will of God. Being heard depends on godliness. If one is not saved, if one is not godly, his prayers will not be heard. Did Jesus get what he prayed for? Is that a loaded question? Did Jesus get what he prayed for? Let me see. If possible, let this cup pass. If you stop there, you miss the whole point. If possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. His prayer was answered with an unqualified yes. I will do what needs to be done, just as you have prayed. Turn with me to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. The supplication, says the American Standard, the supplication of a righteous man availeth much in its working. James just taught us that the prayer of the righteous is not only answered, and this is important, it's not simply answered, that's important, no doubt. However, James just taught us that it availed much. It avails much. We continue and we look at the second part of Isaiah chapter 59. 
You may remember in the first part of Isaiah, Isaiah talking about prayers. God's ear is not full of wax. He can. He has the ability to hear. He's just not listening to you because of your sin. Well, the second part of that is he will not save. Now, in their salvation, in the context of what's going on concerning their salvation, they are talking about physical salvation. However, the same applies to the spiritual salvation of any sinner, any person who is not right with God. And what we have to learn is this. The practice of sin, the habit of sin, prevents God from saving the soul. 1 John 3, verse 4. 1 John 3, verse 4. The habit of sin, the practice of sin, prevents God saving the soul. Verse 4 says, Everyone that doeth sin doeth also lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him ab sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither knoweth him. So here you have a variety of things that need to be pointed out. Here's the way it was taught a number of years ago in debates, and our brethren answered this thought. The child of God cannot, verse 9, cannot sin. And so you have a variety of religious groups that have been brought up that they teach that when you become a Christian, you cannot sin. You will not sin. You will be sinlessly perfect. Well, obviously, that's not true because John stated in 1 John chapter 1, if we say we Christians have no sin, we lie and do not the truth. The problem is that the religious world did not see the E-T-H. What? What? We haven't been taught the E-T-H. Notice with me verse 6. Whosoever abideth E-T-H in him sinneth E-T-H not Whosoever sinneth, E-T-H, hath not seen him, neither knoweth E-T-H him. The E-T-H is the King James and the American Standard's way of saying present tense. If you are abiding in sin, if, you are, if you're practicing sin, if you have the habit of sin, even as a child of God, you haven't seen God, and you don't know God. That's not who God is. Forgiveness is not based on the number of sins you have committed, nor how horrible your sin is. Forgiveness is based on whether you continue in sin or not. Turning to Romans chapter 3, verse 23, we again notice that the practice of sin, practice of sin prevents God from saving the soul. God must be just. That's what Romans 3 teaches. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Verse 26. For the showing, I say, of His, present, of his righteousness at this present season, that He Himself might be just and the justifier of him that hath faith in Jesus. That faith is an obedient faith. That's the way Paul would discuss what faith he has in mind that say. So there has to be an obedient faith, but you're saved by faith, by your trust in Jesus Christ. Now, the only way that God would be able to save sins of those who would trust in him is that he would pay the price. He would give his blood so that men might be saved and purchased from the slavery of sin. The last thing I would like to point out is God saves the penitent Every time. 
since I wrote that, I've added a word, the penitent obedient. And it's just for complete clarification, because if you're penitent, you are obedient. Oh, if you're penitent towards God. Notice with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, a repentance which bringeth no regret, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. He told you what regret in his mind was talking about, and that's a sorrow toward the world. The world makes you full of sorrow because of what you've done. That's not what will bring about salvation, but one's sorrow and change, repentance toward God. Godly sorrow, how you feel toward God, will bring about repentance. Look at Romans 2. Romans 2, verse 4. Remember that in uh, 2 Corinthians, godly sorrow worketh righteousness or worketh unto repentance. He talks about that sorrow towards God. Or despisest thou, Romans 2, 4. The riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. See how the two passages go together? But after thy hardness and penit impenitent heart treasures up for thyself wrath and the day of wrath and the righteous and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. In 2 Peter 3 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some means to count slackness. But is long suffering to you, Lord, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In Luke chapter 13, 3, nay, I tell you, except you repent, you shall all in like manner perish. Now, the fact is that the most wicked of them all can be forgiven. In times past, I remember teaching a lesson on Manasseh at Owasa, Oklahoma. A lady came out, and I've told you this story before, she was highly perturbed because it was a downer. It was so negative. Of course, I'm looking at the passage where a king in Israel was a horrible, horrible sinner, and he shouldn't have been. And he repented, and God forgave him. That was what was so good about the situation with Manasseh. Made to forget. Let me conclude this lesson with a little bit of a thought from our legal system. Back in 2011, about eight, 10 years ago, uh, 1.5 million Walmart employees sued Walmart for benefits and changes. That uh, suit went through the courts in America all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court of the United States ruled 1.5 million employees of Walmart, former employees, employees, and so forth, did not have standing in the court. Did not have standing in the court. That's what we've been looking at today. Israel did not have standing before the court of God because of their sin. Sinners in the world do not have standing before God because they are sinners and they have not met the conditions where they can have standing and be heard and be saved. Whether that is a sinner that's never obeyed God or whether that's a fallen member of the body of Christ. 